Hello class, let's start with chapter six, which is early Christian and Byzantine and Byzantine architecture. So let's uh, let's continue. So we just ended our the Roman Empire, and you'll see that you know it's a very clear segue to uh, the Roman Empire. So let's go a little bit of history. Um, so um, the, so the Roman Empire keeps growing and it just keeps exploding, and and we see a lot of the architecture just really blowing up. You see how they create big, massive um, designs and architecture, and they're just really, really powerful. And they, they keep expanding to the point that they need to split. So eventually, they split uh, split into what's called the Western and here you see this map, you see the western and the eastern. And the eastern side, eventually, it's also known as uh, the Byzantine Empire. Also uh, known where Constantinople is. So Constantine, Emperor Constantine, he's taking over this side. So it's, you know, it's very important to know that it sort of splits in half. And not only does it split in half, but they also have this quadrata, meaning they have, uh, they have sort of two... Uh, emperors or two main people leading each of the uh, sides, but then each uh, of these emperors, they have the, the sort of their vice president. So sort of think of it as they each have their president and their vice president. So there's four people now ruling because of all the need that they really need, uh, of all the things happening, they needed more people to really happen, to really uh, uh, needed more people. So Diocletian was the one that split the empire to the east and the west so that it would be easier to oversee. And since we're talking about Diocletian, Diocletian, he uh, also something that he starts doing is he starts persecuting the Christians. And so this is something very important. So Christianity is becoming big in this moment. Christianity is, is becoming something new that's sort of, uh, to the Roman Empire is sort of looking at something that is uh, fighting them or against them. So they're trying to really suppress them. So they go in this uh, persecution. So the, Roman, the Christians, they go to, they start meeting in houses, they're meeting underground. Uh, they start really doing this secret meeting. So, so the Christian church or the Christian meetings are really hidden. So right now I want you to imagine, you know, it's really not very, um, big churches, basilicas, cathedrals. It's its really hidden inside of houses. But all of that changes when Constantine legalizes Christianity. When Constantine, he, he, he changes this in 313, and he signs something called the Edict of Milan. So here there's a, a depiction of that edict that he did in Milan. And this sort of... Um, so the story goes that Constantine is going into war and he sees this vision of a cross and the cross sort of is guiding them and following. And so, so they start following and he tells his army, follow it. And, and eventually they win this, this battle. And as a sign of, of uh, surrender or thankfulness, uh, Constantine decides to legalize Christianity. It, there's debate if he became a Christian or not, but uh, so this is, uh, it's not really known. Many say that he didn't really convert to Christianity, but he did legalize it through the Edict of Milan. And eventually the Edict of Thessalonica was something that pushed it even further. This was uh, the Edict of Milan, uh, despite it made, uh, made it legal, now it made that uh, Christianity, it was the required uh, religions to be Christian. So now it made it the, the, the religion to follow. So it really, really pushed Christianity even uh, further. And further on, we go into the fall of Rome. And when we start talking about the fall of Rome, it gets a little complicated because it's it's talking mainly about the Western Empire. So, so Rome began to decline. The city really decayed with political corruption and the lack of leadership. And there was a lot of barbarian tribes really coming into the borders and attacking. And so Rome was sacked many times. And, and but this was when the 
fall of the Western Empire started to happen. But even though the Western Empire started to really um, lose power, so this side starts losing power, the Eastern Empire under Constantine is still keeps um, really uh, flourishing. Eventually, Justinian, he's someone that eventually he was ruling the Eastern, uh, but eventually he's able to sort of conquer back the Western. So he becomes a very strong political person, very strong um, uh, emperor, it, and then um, and it, which really creates a lot of changes. And through his time, he also cared a lot about architecture. So he starts building a lot. So through his reign is really where the Byzantine really happened. So basically this period on is more Christian, early, what we're calling the early Christian. And after Justinian, that's sort of where the Byzantine kind of evolves and starts. So that's sort of the way that we want to look at it. Um, so Justinian was one of the first um, uh, great emperors that really tried to really restore Constantinople and really rebuild a lot of the projects that we later on will we're going to be able to see. So here's another timeline which is uh, very 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 similar to what we were seeing um, to what we were seeing previous timeline. This timeline, I just wanted to go even further back and, you know, we talked that here's where the Roman Empire um, begins and sort of what we started, we saw last time, uh, we saw the fires and the Colosseum is built and, and, but now this is sort of where we start and the Rome splits into two because Constantine becomes emperor. So Constantine moves to the east and when he's in the east, he starts his new city that he really wanted to call uh, Rome again, um, but people really liked them, and they were like, "No, let's call it Constantinople under uh, basically on him." So then, uh, the big change that leads to this revival of architecture of this new era of architectures is Christianity, and it's it's as a sole religion. Eventually, uh, they do get sacked again; they become independent. Eventually, as we talked about, the fall, uh, eventual fall of ancient Rome. So let's keep going. Uh, I have this image and I want you really to take you to those times. I think history is not just about numbers and dates and information and pictures. It's really trying to transport yourself and feel like you're in those moments. And one of the paintings, I, I really love architectural history, but I really, really one of my biggest passions as well is art history, uh, which I believe they go hand in hand and one of the biggest, uh, greatest artists is, is Caravaggio. And I don't think we'll talk about it too much. He's, he's a bit later on, his work is later on. But, uh, but one of the, the paintings that he does, even though it's not for this time, but it still depicts stories that they were hearing at those times, is one of the stories that you might know, and it's the story of Peter being crucified. And if you know the story, Peter is being crucified but he's not being crucified the way Jesus was, which is, you know, standing up or facing up. Uh, Peter is crucified upside down. And the way Peter, and because Peter is crucified upside down, it was in a way, you know, very um, degrading experience. And the people who, the author, many art historians talk that, uh, as your body is facing upside down, something that happens, and sorry, this is a little maybe uh, too gross for some, but it, what, something that happens is is your body is just losing all of the the um, the fluids from inside, and you eventually defecate on yourself. So, so this picture is sort of creating that image of I want to like, imagine you being there, and only that. But something Caravaggio does is that everything that he's doing, he's pointing to this. He's creating this sort of line that's guiding your eyes to this moment. And he's also exaggerated some sort of the, the, the lighting and the hand to, to create this very dramatic movement. It creates this sort of axis that is pointing you to this. And if you see this in real life, something that I've always tell people when they look at art history is always imagine that you look at this, 30% of what it really is. 
you can never compare a, a digital image to a painting that is so much bigger in size, the colors are different, and everything is the experience of being there rather than a digital image will never really do it justice. So what Caravaggio does is he does this moment where he moves and it feels as if the nail is being moved slowly. So you just imagine watching this image and you feel as if this nail is being moved from the tendons in his hands. So you can feel the pain that Peter is feeling in this moment. So this was part of the, the persecution that we talked about that the, the Christians were, were facing at the time, this, this massive persecution, and eventually, uh, as we mentioned, eventually uh, Constantine, through some uh, edicts, he eventually uh, passes all these laws, and now they can have uh, a church. So now we real now we see people that suffer for Christianity. So now Christianity was something that was hidden, was you can no one can know about it, and now it's on the forefront. Now everyone has to be Christian. It's it's the law. And so what happens to people like Peter? People uh, people like Peter become uh, saints, become uh, martyrs for the for the religion. They become someone very 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 important. Some of the the the, the the ones who started the religion. So they become um, very, very important later on for the Christian church. And we'll see that uh, as we keep going. And I want to talk really quickly about Venusa's, uh, Firmitas, and Utilitas really, really fast. Uh, we talked about the Truvius did this. He talked about it in his book about the three uh, different ones, which is uh, uh, this has to do with firmness, this has to do with you know, function. Um, and this has to do with beauty. And the reason I want to talk to you about this is because, again, it's always going to come back to these three things in a way. And But now, when you talk about beauty, beauty is not... The, the, the Roman and the, and the early Christians, they're not saying beauty is abstract. There is some sort of pattern as to what they are describing as beauty. So when we talk about... When, we, when you think about beauty... Think about what are the principles that they're using to uh, to label this as beauty. They're looking for beauty. So something that you have to realize, they're looking for to create this perfect triangle. And we talk about and we'll talk about triangles later on. Um, but once they're looking for those things, they're looking for something to create this, and then looking for these things, which is decorum, symmetry, which we've seen. Maybe you've noticed it before. Proportion. Uh, the, the, so it becomes less experimental. It becomes more of a sort of cookie cutter. So you see that uh, all of the basilicas and all the designs, they look very similar. And it's because of that, because there's some sort of idea that they're, okay, this is the idea of the standard of beauty. So they start following that. There is experimentation, but not as much as maybe there was not such a, such a certain standard. And then you see the rhythm. Um, so let's keep going. So this was the ancient basilicas. We we saw this. This was the ancient basilica, Basilica Nova, in Rome, Italy. And we saw this in in, our, in the last lecture, and uh, you all saw it in your quiz in your midterm. And you see, remember here was the the Roman baths, and so so basilicas. You know, there was this open plan. It was a very uh, a place for people to meet. You can see some people here walking around. And that was a very a meeting place, basically. So I just wanted you, as we say basilicas, we're not talking about the ancient basilicas or the ones that the Romans were using. Now we're talking about Christian basilicas. So that's a big, uh, something important to really understand. So we start seeing how a new, a new plan starts to emerge. So in this image, we see three different floor plans. And I want you to look at them a uh, little bit while you're uh, seeing this. And what are some similarities that you see from these three floor plans? This is the first one, the second one is the third one. So the, the fundamental elements of the basilica short plans are very evident here. Uh, longitudinal axis, so you see this, you know, very longitudinal axis that it goes through the atrium and the narthex and through the nave to the to ending in the apse. Uh, 
where the altar is located. So the apse is where the altar is located. And here you don't see in the plan, but they all sort of have this high clarity, uh, clear story for light, for the, where the windows would come in. And then they have this triumphal arch-like elements that appear at the entry of the of the, of the uh, atrium. So that so that the idea of this sort of like uh, arch of triumph. So this very important entrance is sort of doing this also uh, at the, in the as they go through the atrium and to from the nave to the altar area, symbolizing that the entry into the more sacred territory. So they start seeing how you know this sort of narthex kind of uh, divides the space. So something that I want you to you know start looking into again if we go back to the basilica, it was this basically a box, very badly drawn here right now. So this was basically what we, you know, I think I have shapes here. Yeah, so it was basically a box. You know, you kind of see it, you do some sort of, um, you see some circle coming out here and a little bit, you know, kind of happening uh, at the end, but, and so let's start playing with that idea. You see that happening here, but it's more rectilinear. It's very, very rectilinear. But now as you start seeing, as you start seeing this, what do you notice? You do see that, uh, that rectangle happening. You do see the rectangle happening. You see the rectangle happening and you do see that circle that we talked about, which is very, very, it's kind of hard to, to draw with this. You see, you see that circle at the end, but what is something new that is being added? The something new that is being added is this rectangle, and now it's crossing by on its side. And and what is that rectangle? That is called the transept. And, and if you sort of start seeing it, you start realizing that what they're trying to do is they're trying to create a, a church plant that is based on the basilica, but still its own thing. And now it's it's very independent. Now it has its own language. It has its own identity. It has its own typology in a way. So this is uh, sort of what started happening is you start getting this transept, this basilica, and this, this rectilinear, and you start getting all these different areas and spaces to play around inside. But one of the most important things that I want you to see is that this rec this the reason why they added this? It was one because they do they did need space for sh one of the things is that they needed space so they added this. Uh, but the second was the second thing was because as they added this and they combined it with this, what shape is it creating? Uh, yes, my lines are really really bad, but what shape do you see? Hopefully, uh, besides my ugly drawing, you see that it's it's a cross. So the cross is something that's, uh, you know, if you're familiar with the story of Jesus and being crucified, he was crucified on a, a cross. And so uh, the cross was a very important symbol till this day for the Christian community. So that you see this the transit and the transit, the word transit means simply means across, across the space, creating a space across. And so it, they, they added this for, you know, uh, different purposes. But one of the biggest reasons was it could create this cross. And at the top, you have this apse, which is for the altar. And again, it's sort of creating, now you start seeing, it starts creating this sort of uh, body, this sort of, now it's like a person uh, being created. So they're trying to create this representation of a body. So that becomes very, very, very interesting. So here you see um, uh, some, you know, you start seeing uh, different places of the, the, the thing. And so it's very important that you, you understand what's sort of happening inside. Uh, you get a nave to the middle. The big middle is called the nave, which you see here, it's called the nave. And the reason it was called the nave is because I'll show you a picture right now, but I don't know if it's the next picture. Yeah, uh, here's the uh, picture. So the, the center here is the nave. And as you start seeing, uh, how did they, how were they building previously? They were building with, with you know, porcelana, with cement, brick, very, 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 very heavy, very strong. But now they started merging this new 
um, style of, of creating architecture, which was using wooden truss, which before they sort of used for like sort of uh, creating the frame, but now it was part of the architecture. And as you see here, they start creating these trusses, this joists, and these beams. And, um, and, and maybe you've noticed, but it's made out of wood. And, and it's made out of wood. And so because the people that would make these naves were people who would make, uh, were making the boats for, for either fishing and war, or all these different boats. And so that's where we get the word nave. So maybe you're familiar with the word navy or in Spanish, you know, nave or naval. So that's where we get all of those words that deal with, you know, uh, boats and, and, and that profession. And so the people that would sometimes would build the boats, you know, they, they use the same techniques to be trusses for these. And so what that allowed for the church to do is that it was a lot thinner, a lot, lot thinner, which could allow for more light to come in. So now they, they start adding light here in the Clara story. And they also create this very wide hallway called the nave. And, and besides the nave, there's two places called the aisles. There's a sort of, so the aisle, you know, very, very simple, um, very simple representation. So it's very simple to, when you think of it, is, is you have an aisle, you have a nave, you have another aisle, and, you know, you have the, the roof, you know, um, the roof that was that should have done a triangle. I'm pretty sure it had, no, it doesn't have, uh, but it does, you know, a roof above them. And there are other parts that I think I will mention. I will, I will, but uh, this is a basic representation of what the, the typology of the church begins to uh, emerge as. This is an image that is very, very important. And the reason I'm saying it's important because there will be, it's going to be on your next quiz. And maybe in your final, I don't remember exactly, but I know for sure in the quiz that's coming up for this uh, for this upcoming quiz, it's going to be there. And so it's going to basically ask you to label each of these sections. So uh, if you want to study this part, it's going to really, really help you. And and so this is St. Peter. Uh, we, we saw Peter right now in an image of Caravaggio, you know, being crucified up down. So, so what they believe was that Peter was actually buried, you know, below. Peter was actually buried there. So this building began as a martyrium. We'll talk about that later. Uh, basically, a cemetery um, for the apostle Peter, and they built above his tomb. And so now the now the they building this. Um, uh, this, and this is the same church that we were looking in the image, in the, and this is also St. Peter's. Uh, but now that the Peter is buried there, it gives us uh, this idea that um, it becomes a very important church. So uh, as, as similar as we've seen before, relics and, and having some sort of saints associated um, gives it a lot of uh, very important value. So this has become a very important church because of that. But let's look into the organization. So this is sort of the main hall, you know, where people are walking by. And, and what do you notice? What is the first thing that they see? The first thing that they see is this gatehouse. And, and the reality is that it's not a clear, it's just, it looks like a house. It looks like a very simple, um, not to fancy maybe they, they were used to this sort of architecture and it's not really representing what's happening in the back so something that they're trying to do is that the roman architecture um the roman architecture really was about grandeur and that was about a, a bit showing off and it was about we do it because we can and it was a it was a very very uh you know in your face architecture but but Christianity architecture was a bit the opposite. It was a bit more humble. It was a bit more uh, we don't want really people to show off. Or it was not too much about the architecture, but it was they really wanted to make it more about the spiritual side, about the spiritual process of going through the architecture, about the spiritual effect and the spiritual um, and spiritual uh, journey that sort of you're going through. 
as you're going through these through this building this is the, the, the spiritual experience that you will get to to um, go through so that's what they're really really going through for and so they, they build this gatehouse and then as, they, as you keep going you're able to cross and you get into this open courtyard but it's called the atrium so and again you can see it here in plan remember to talk about plan perspectives we can see here in plan you sort of go through you enter into the atrium and then you're met with this with this fountain that is not here in the plan but uh but it's, you met with this fountain this fountain is it's where people would get baptized uh they would do some sort of religious activity some sort of religious uh, Christians there. So, but mostly it was this sort of baptism place, a sort of cleansing place before you enter. And remember, this is all about a religious experience. So it's this cleansing or purifying before you're able to enter. And then you get into this narthex. And this narthex that you see here, and you see it here again, this narthex is, is, is in closed space, but it's enclosed for uh, people that are not uh, allowed yet to enter. So this is for a certain people that have not uh, been baptized, and certain people that have committed certain sins, and there's there's uh, a certain um, process that they do go through. So this narthex is for these people that that were not allowed to come in yet, but they were but they could still stand there or maybe sit. I don't know. They they could manage a way to sit, but just they were able to be there and they would still be able to hear and sort of participate uh, audibly from, from, from this area. And once you were allowed to enter, then you uh, were able to enter into this nave and to this aisles, you know. And so this aisles, what happens is that this is the most uh, common seating area, same as here, depending on the church. Uh, but usually in the aisles, there was all these images uh, places for for candles for uh that connect you to to different um, saints so so pilgrims there's a lot of pilgrimages and people could just walk around it here through this colonnade area and just walk around in this this in this place and again so now you start seeing how is this this sort of journey of of it, you have to clean yourself and if you don't have the right access you can and then sort of you 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 stop here and eventually you come to the the holiest place which is the altar which is here in the apse which is again sort of if you're looking at it as a body it's sort of uh, the head and you you're connected through this uh, transept and and here's where you know they would have the the, the play for the eucharist and and, and and the choir and all these things. So you start seeing this uh, this plan. Uh, it sort of becomes very very common uh, to be copied in other churches. So remember this plan. It's going to be pretty important for your quiz. And it's also uh, this is basically the representation of um, archit uh, early Christian architecture. If you just remember this this plan, it basically. As long as you remember the, the, the Latin cross plan, um, I think you're you're good. Uh, there's there's some different churches that um, that sort of starting doing it. I I won't go into detail into these churches because the most important thing is you understand the end basically. But um, but uh, these are just sort of churches that s sort of started setting. Uh, the example churches, the 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 final uh, creation was what we saw at Old Saint Peter's, but there were some some churches that here you start seeing doesn't have it's missing the the transit is sort of missing that the transit is still hasn't uh, created, uh, but here what they do have is some sort of apps is starting to to begin. So the Church of Nativity is also a very interesting one. The reason why it's so big is because it believes that this was a place where actually Jesus was born. So again, it, it's connecting this to um, to a greater thing. So it's a tagging over rotunda at the end is for, you know, the, the traditional side of Jesus' birth. And so, and so this place is, uh, it, it becomes a hybrid of a martyrium. And the materials, what they do is they have a um, circle plan, a, a, a round plan. So, and versus combined with an axial plan. So that's something that we're going to start seeing again. And 
again throughout the different uh, the different designs. So we're just gonna keep working going with that. Another one is is uh, San Giovanni Laterno, and the San Giovanni Laterno again it's it's uh, it's one of the first that we start seeing this transept emerge. Not super exaggerated. You might even be like. There's no transit there, but it, at those times it really was a bit revolutionary, and you still see how it's the, the organization is very axial, but it's sort of also this is sort of uh, breaking that symmetry. It's, it has its own sort of um, symmetry uh, going on. So we start seeing a, a, the idea of the, the transit being built. Something that I do want you to notice is very, uh, again, we won't talk about it too much, uh, but it's the idea of, of the Greek cross plan. And, and so this was also a, a very um, common plan. So the two common plans that they were using was the Latin cross, which we just saw, right, which we've been talking about. But the other one was the Greek cross plan, and this one's more squarish, is more um, symmetrical in the sense it's more of a plus sign if you could see it like that. And but but uh, again, uh, it was it was also uh, representing the cross. And so uh, the buildings increase in geometry and geometric complexity. Plaster was starting to be used all around, and and they're starting to use more mosaics and they started to use more complex zones, and they started to really, really play with new things that we're going to start seeing right now. So this is a Baptist. I want to talk about uh, different Baptist, different type types that start um, emerging during the Christian time. So we talked about the, the, the Christian church, which was the Latin cross plan, which is a probably one of the most important. But the second one is also not rank, it's second place, but it's also some important is the baptistries. In baptistries, we sort of saw in that atrium, there was this um, sort of fountain that they did um, baptize people there, but th they also started doing uh, separate buildings. Uh, so the church was here and then they would do a baptistry um, separate from the actual, um, from the actual basilica. And so what was a baptistry? Basically, it was a place where they could be uh, baptized. So, so the Christian religion, they believe that being submerged under water is the symbol of resurrection, of living your old life behind and, and um, being given a new life, so being born again. So baptistries were a place, and again, we talked about how in order to get in, there was this, you needed to be baptized. So baptism, being baptized was a big deal. It was very, very, very important. And usually in the very, in the top, before, inside uh, of this dome, like, you would see, you know, images and paintings here of a dove. And so the sort of, they create this very spiritual experience as, as you are being baptized. Uh, usually they were octagonal, uh, octagonal in shape, as you see here in this baptistry of Orthodox in Ravenna, and because the number eight is the number of resurrection for them, so so they, they so not all of them were, were octagonal. There were some circular. There were some other different shapes, but the number eight it was a number that they used for resurrection. So they 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 had the symbolic meaning, and uh, sometimes they also combined they. They call them sometimes in mini basilicas, and the reason why they call them mini basilicas is one because of the importance, and um, there's some really, 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 really amazing baptistries. So it wasn't just this like place for a pool or water. It was really, really an amazing piece of architecture inside, and it was based on a, a central plan. And the central plan. We talked about it uh, before, but the central plan is basically a circle, and it sort of uh, creates that it's everything of revolving in, in, a, in a very round place. So we start seeing this Latin cross or this Greek plan, and uh, which is axial. This is axial, meaning it's sort of cut in half. Is this sort of going through a a, a very clear path to where you're going? But a central plan is more round. There's no very specific 
uh, where you, there is a main entrance, but other than that, you know, there's no um, hierarchy. Other than, very different from the Latin cross plan or the basilicas is that you can clearly see um, you can clearly see the hierarchy. You know, this was the most holy place. This was medium holy. You know, still holy. You know, the narthex was like for the you know unholy. You know, sort of. Is, so there's this procession of getting holier. But the the more central plan is a bit more open uh, for everyone. But the central plan means that the center is the most important. So what does that mean? That usually in the center, that's where you would get, you know, the images, that's where you would get the water, you, that's where something sort of happened in the in the center. And then we go to mausoleums and martyriums, which are very, very similar. One of the main differences um, is that it, uh, the martyrium is, it comes, you know, from the word martyr, so it, it it means that it was someone that you know died, and now uh, there's sort of venerate someone as a saint or someone important, and so the the body might be there, or specifically, most likely, it's uh, a part of their body, so an ear, um, a, a tooth, a, you know, a, the tongue. I've seen one with the tongue, and that one was really really interesting. Uh, so they sort of create this, you know, sort of a, a relic from 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 uh, people that have passed away. The mausoleum is more of just simply a more uh, very easy to think about. It was a tomb. It's more of a tomb, more of a crypt. And so uh, here it, we're looking at the plan of San Constanza in Rome. And the plan of San Constanza, San Constanza, she was actually the daughter of Constantine. So Constantine, like I said, people believe that he didn't really uh, convert to Christianity, but the daughter was a believer. So they, she was able to have this mausoleum, this place where, where she was uh, buried. And again, is it, I'm going to ask you, hopefully you know, is this a Latin cross plan, a, a Greek cross plan? Is this axial or is this central? And hopefully you answer the that is the central plan. And you you see this narthex idea. It's it's sort of playing with the with the concepts of basilica. You start seeing a lot of the same concepts, uh, but they're sort of just shaped around. You see a narthex. You sort of see this aisle. So instead of having the aisles just like this, you see like aisles sort of all around and and you start seeing this sort of app sort of happening and so it's, it starts creating this very interesting uh central plan the way i like to describe this plan or this this specifically or san consensus is very onion type you know different layers you start seeing like this one two three four five you know sort of like a, an onion that you start peeling away and you start creating this Ambulatory. ambulatory just simply means that you can walk around through these different spaces. So it's a very, very interesting uh, architecture as well. So uh, now we're going to go. So that was the early Christian architecture. Now we start uh, getting to, so Rome, uh, the Western Empire really has uh, fallen. Uh, the Eastern Empire is still doing good, still sort of prospering. Uh, years have passed, and now this new emperor is taking control. <clears throat> Sorry, <clears throat> and it's called Justinian. And Justinian, he's called Justinian the First, and he's very, very um, important. He was, uh, he's, uh, he was one of the the, the best uh, emperors. He served from 527 to 565, and he put an end to many disputes and started creating a lot of. Uh, taking control of different parts of, of the Western Empire again, or Africa and Italy. And so he really starts facilitating the empire again. And so the people living and probably didn't realize it changed too much. But really, historians look at look back at that period and, and they look at Justinian's reign as a sort of a segue, as a sort of uh, a shift into this new era of architecture. And, and so, and so, um, and so, this is where the, the Byzantine or Byzantine architecture really emerges, really, really strong through Justinian and and its ruling. And so, and so, one of the 
very characteristics of them. It's a very clear preference for domes. And so in the Basilican, we didn't see too many domes. Domes were sort of playing, were there here and there, uh, but they weren't, domes were the main idea. And so that's one of the big clear changes that we see in the Byzantine. Um, saw the domes as, a, the, as we saw the Romans and we saw in the Pantheon. We'll talk about this later on as more, more examples, but they did see the dome as a symbol of a, of a sphere connecting to the cosmos and connecting the earth and, and heaven once again. So here we see Justinian. In Justinian, this is for Santa Ravenna. This is a, a mosaic that they do in Santa Ravenna, which is really interesting because he wasn't really... Um, um, there, it was just basically he he had this commission, and what we'll, we'll, it's I mean I could talk about this mosaic for a while, but I'm trying not to because I don't want to say too much. But you see how basically he's in the center. He has this sort of uh, uh, helio, this sort of mandorla, so it's just symbolizing that um, he's you know very religious or has this, this sacred uh, connotation with him, and he's holding. Uh, would, would be the Eucharist, the bread, uh, would, were, you know, so the Eucharist was uh, what, um, one of the most important things that they did, which is eating uh, this bread, which symbolized the body of Jesus, we drink this wine, which would symbolize the blood of Jesus. And so it's, uh, it was something that they would do to commemorate, they, they still do to commemorate uh, the, with Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus. And so basically by him holding this, he's basically saying, I am partaking, or I'm leading this church um, through the Eucharist. So he's basically saying, you know, I'm, I'm pretty, uh, pretty important. And you start seeing how the people that are, you know, pretty important, they have distinct thick faces. Uh, but all these people, they sort of just blend in. They look like they did copy and paste. So you can start seeing that maybe these people were people that uh, were pretty important there. We see that this is Maxentius. Um, this was added later on, so it's not too, uh, it was there. But you start seeing, you know, um, all these different, the, the book, the, the cross, and again, and so this, and the colors that are using this royalty color. Something that was very, very important is to know that um, we, we come from the Greek architecture, and the Greek architecture, they were very uh, naturalistic. They wanted to create sculptures that were freestanding, that they look almost human-like, this perfect idea of the perfect symmetry of humans. And here, now we're looking at this image, and they look very flat. They look very like they just pasted in the wall. You don't really see them lifelike. It's just really more interesting in telling the story and telling the the, 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 what it means to them rather than making it naturalistic. You see that they're almost like floating, that you don't even see them, you know, touching a ground. So the, 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 the type of art really, really changes. Last thing about Justinian, Justinian, he had a wife, um, I'm blanking out the name, I'm thinking Teresa something. Uh, the wife was uh, very, very, uh, very interesting story. I'm just mentioning this if you want to Google her, but she had a very, very interesting story. Some say that she was a an actress or a dancer, and so in those times that was like really, really a low job and not very important, or it was very frowned upon. And he basically changed the laws in order to be able to marry her. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because there's another mosaic right uh, across from it. And she's also being depicted there, and she's holding um, um, the other. I'm blanking out, but I, either I think it's going to be the the cup of the wine. So she's also leading them into this Eucharist moment. So she's elevated to that to that level. So so that's a really great story of you know starting from nothing and being at to the same level of Justinian, which is really really. Uh, unheard of at those times. It was a really, really great story. So let's keep going with the, you know, um, with the uh, Byzantine churches, Byzantine churches. And uh, these are three different plans. We see the plan of Hagia Sophia, uh, San Vita de Ravenna, which we should talked about the mosaics right now, uh, San um, Sagos and Bacchus in Constantinople. 
and, and San Marco in Venice. So I won't, I, I'll talk about a couple of these later on, but I just want you to have a clear overview of all of them. Again, uh, Byzantine, they've really adopt this idea of domes. So you start seeing domes, you start really seeing domes happening. The domes becomes a big, big, big. So you see a lot of domes happening. Uh, they, uh, start, um, you, you have this clear idea, okay, Byzantine. The second thing is that they're still doing a basilica type. So they're still longing or looking for the same idea of, of an apse and the same idea of aisles and the same idea of, a, of an artex and the same idea of a nave. So you still see this sort of nave happening here despite, you know, now it has some domes. Uh, this is very interesting because this is Alice Sophia and this is, um, this is Sargis Basilica. And, but they call this one the mini Sophia or little Sophia. So it's pretty interesting. You, you start seeing how they all sort of start merging into each other. This one is the one that I guess is a bit more similar. This one goes back to what kind of plant? Is it a Latin cross plant or is it a Greek cross plant? And it's more Greek cross plant. You know, it's not perfectly a Greek cross plant, but it, it is more of a Greek cross plant than a landing cross plan. So let's go through, uh, again, since we're talking about it's important to, to know a little bit about how the domes are working. One of the things that is, um, uh, that sort of starts happening is, is this idea of the five domes, uh, which I forget, I'm forgetting the word right now in this instant. I know it's uh, quad, quad, something. I'll look it up right now. But it was basically uh, this idea of five uh, domes uh, sort of connected and, and creating this nine part grid with the perimeter bearing walls. And, and so it's something that it becomes a sort of standard having this five sort of domes. So, so look for that, start counting them and you, you'll start doing this. And the dome, it was um, something that, you know, the way that it starts working is starts creating this square base. And it has uh, this sort of arches, you know, sort of happening in the bottom. And, but uh, as they start connecting this dome, what starts happening is they start removing some parts and just reliving some things. And so making it a, in a way uh, here, it's a better picture. It starts removing this. And so, but before the, the Pantheon and others, they did the dome. And so in order for whatever, wherever it was going to stand, it had to be super, super, super thick, super, super thick. So the walls holding it had to be really, really thick. So in a way, what the Pantheon was doing is really filling up this place and also filling up this place. But the, what, the, what they started, the Byzantines, they started doing is they start opening this, creating arches, and thus creating this triangle. And when they create the triangle, you might imagine that it starts losing strength, but in reality, it's gaining strength. What, because what they start doing is called a point load. So instead of sending all the load here, they're, sending the, they're distributing the loads into um, different points. So it's called point loads. And it creates, and, and some of the arches are sort of, um, bracing each other. So it's it's a very interesting concept. And thus, the, the dome really feels like it's floating because it really feels like it's not being held and held by anything. It just really feels very, very light. And not only that, but a lot of the domes, they start adding windows, uh, uh, starting adding openings in the, ta in the top, making it even feeling uh, lighter. So that's very, very, very interesting to seeing that. And, and so we talked about the dome represents what? What are they connecting it? Uh, let me see if I can delete this. Uh, the dome, the circles represent what? Usually it represents uh, the cosmos, the heavens, and, and all of that. And the rectangle usually means Earth. So we're just seeing they have a square base, a circle. But then now, what is the, ne the new shape that is being that is being born and is this uh, is this triangle that is being born here? It's either the triangles and the triangles there is they become very very important and um, 
Christianity because it's a symbol of, of the Trinity, of the Holy Trinity. And so the Holy Trinity for them, is, it's a symbol of the number three and the, the idea of threes is very, very important. So again, they're trying to say heaven and earth are meeting, but now it's not because of human proportions. It's not because of, of uh, a person, not because of geometry. It's really because of this, the Trinity is because of of God that is is bringing heaven to earth, which was what what Jesus symbolized for them is heaven coming to earth and being with them. So so we start seeing again this very religious experience for them of the, the square, the triangle, and the circle coming really now even more to life in a geometric and a spiritual way. So let's go into uh, Aga Sophia. So uh, so Aga Sophia comes from the word uh, wisdom. You kind of see it in philosophy, philosophia. You see it in Spanish, Sophia. So it comes from from the, the idea that it's a you know place of, of wisdom. And so this was uh, one of the archetypes, Isidor, Melus, and Antemius Salema. And it was it was um, the reason why this is possible one of the most iconic and famous one of this era is because it did something. We talked about the we did we talked about the basilica plan, which is a sort of cross plan. We talked about the central plan. The central plan is this sort of onion like ambulatory sort of circle. And and Hagia Sophia is able to reconcile, to combine the to and to create this merge and, and to create this amazing beautiful architecture. Uh, when Justinian created this, or you know, uh, finally finished it, he cried out. It said that he cried, Solomon, I have out down the, you know, making reference of the Solomon's Temple, which if, uh, has always been the uh, idea of perfection of beauty. And and the Solomon's Temple, it's something that very, 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 very recurring. Eventually, you start seeing in other architecture. I don't know if we'll get to that, but you start seeing this, what is called the, the Solomon Column, the Solomon, Solomon col Column. And it's just architects later on, they start doing that as a way of saying, Solomon had this column, made this building so beautiful. So if my uh, design has a Solomon Column, it's at the same level as the temple. So they were always looking to compare themselves to the to the Temple of Solomon. This is just something interesting to kind of have in mind, uh, to sort of uh, have in mind with, with this. Um, let's keep going. Uh, so yeah, so I Sophia, yeah, one of the things that also talking about um, Justinian, so this building was actually built not uh, it wasn't the first time. So it was actually Constantine had built here, and it got destroyed, and and um, and Justinian was building on top of it. And in a way, he was he was designing and building in a way that he was trying not to show off, but in a way to build upon it. You know, you could, he was literally building upon it, and he was saying mine will be better and it will be different and it will be its own thing so he had this sort of pressure of wanting to do something so so audacious so this building uh, contains many of uh, one of the greatest domes of, the, of its age and that's why i'm comparing it to the pantheon because remember the pantheon was really the standard what future dome buildings would look like and so and so um the exterior shows you, you later on see some buttresses, but that was added later on. Uh, the view, so this you see like four big really uh, arches that support this great dome. The dome is really built of brick, uh, so that's why it's very very thin. We'll see that right now in a section. And, and the pendentives uh, they create this square bay that um, uh, sort of different 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 base inside we'll see that again right now in the different plans uh so one of the uh i'll talk about it right now in the next image but, uh, about the, the section and the elevation but right now looking at just the facade even though this ones are sort of you know referencing this one is sort of referencing this one 
does it look the same from the exterior? And the answer is no. Hopefully you guessed that, that they look very, very different. You, know, you probably could inside, you could see sort of some resemblance, but outside it's practically, you know, very, you know, sort of this bad party maybe you can see it, but it's very different. So the, one of the main reasons is because this was a, a pagan temple. It was for, for Pantheon, many gods. And now, so they were creating this um, Christian temple, this Christian uh, church. So they really wanted to stay away from anything that would resemble or bring back memories from the begins. So that's something also important to understand from this time, this sort of uh, fading away or trying to step back from uh, anything that could resemble that, that architecture. And here you start seeing, again, as I mentioned, uh, I don't, I didn't bring a, I didn't show a plan of the, oh no, I do have it in an image. Um, yeah, I do have it in the next image, but I'll talk about this one a little bit and then we'll jump into the next one. And so uh, basically a, a very simple way of describing this is cascading domes. I heard someone one day describing this as cascading domes. And for me, it clicked. It was like, yeah, okay, I get it now. This is <laughs> cascading domes makes sense uh, of this architecture. Um, but again, very, very, very similar. You start seeing this pendentives, you start seeing the stones, you start seeing different piers holding it. But one of the things that you we talked about is it has this um, it has this central plan, the circle plan. But at the same time, you know, it's it has this sort of cross, this sort of Greek cross plan going into into the plans. So you see this nave, you start seeing the aisles. So you start seeing all these different, the, the inner narthex, you start seeing, you know, so you start seeing basically a, a Greek cross plan with a, 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 a uh, with the central plan. So it's, it's amazing at how it all sort of just merges into this uh, idea. The gallery is a sort of, it's another place. So we talked about the Clary story, but the, the gallery is another thing that also allows, it's allowing now more light to come into this building. So again, we're comparing it to, to the Pantheon because the Pantheon was, was basically the standard. But now look at these floor plans and look at these sections. What do you notice the most? Remember, this dome has to sit on a perimeter, and they basically created this huge perimeter. They did do some niches that we talked about, but still, they I'm not saying that they were not smart or they, they it wasn't too creative because it was really, really, really impressive. And again, one of the greatest architectures, and most don't follow this. It was really, 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 really impressive what the Pantheon did. But to a certain extent, it was very clear and uh, um, um, easy to understand that you know you have something heavy, you have something heavy, and it sort of um, needs something strong to be uh, hold by. So it's this idea of heavy and something. Strong to hold you. Um, sorry, the computer is freezing a little bit. So hopefully, I didn't lose you all. Um, but it, but the other one now with Agus Sophia, it, it's you. You don't see that heaviness in the plan. You don't see that heaviness in the section. It sort of feels super, super, super thin. These two images are not in scale, so they're not the same scale. You know, it's 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 uh, not good to ever do this. I'm I'm sorry. You know, uh, it's not good to ever. Um, bring two plans and not bring them in the same scale because it's really not fair. Um, but uh, but still, you can see that you know it's it's very it's designed to be very 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 thin. So they're just creating this couple of piers that are just sort of holding it on and creating these triangles here in the plan, which is an amazing creating bringing back the circle the square and the triangle. So so hopefully you're you're uh, looking at this and being super amazed um, as I as I am even as I read this again. Uh, so this is just kind of an interior view. So you're seeing you know the central plan, so you're seeing you know the, the aisles, we see the 
you know, the gallery, the Claire story, it was just seeing again this light just coming from inside and just making it even feel like it's even lighter, that it's just sort of floating. So when you're inside, you just feel like there's this huge dome just sort of floating above you. And it just makes you, again, connects you to this uh, higher level, this spiritual level. And so there's this uh, poet that sort of said this as all these details fitted together with incredible skill in midair and floating off from each other and resting only on the parts next to them produce a single and most extraordinary harmony in the work and yet do not permit the spectator to linger much over the study of any of them, but each detail attracts the eye and draws it into irresistibly to itself. It's just, it just basically feels like it's floating and you don't even know how it's holding on, but you don't care about that. You just care about how amazing it is. Uh, inside you see that, you know, there's not a lot of depictions of uh, Christian uh, uh, since this has eventually changed. Um, it went from Christian to, I think, Islam, and now I think it's just a museum because it is in modern day Turkey. So it now is not serving the same original purpose, um, but eventually, but it's still, um, so now that's where you see uh, different symbols now inside. Uh, I'm going to talk about one of these cathedrals, but uh, again, I wanted to bring back a little bit of my story. So here I am in, in Venice, um, and right here by the side and this is a trip I took you know it's uh, again on the school trip and a while back and so this is a one of the uh, piazzas in, in, in Venice and you know, I don't I don't know why what we're doing with that group picture but um but it was pretty fun and the next picture this one is um it's actually later on much later on I, I decided to this this is like trip um uh on a trip and um my sister and and we went again to Venice and then and so I was sort of became the guide to our you know the group it was pretty fun I didn't get paid for that but it was so fun and uh and so we had this uh, something that I want just a little tour tip is that in front of the, uh, the San Marco Cathedral or which we're about to see there's all these pigeons and we'll, and almost in any picture that you google there's like thousands of pigeons and I think because of all the people that are there and they're just feeding them, they just kind of became accustomed to it. Um, but my sister, uh, she loves birds, she loves uh, pigeons. So um, there's people there just sort of like selling you food for a euro or something. And they give you a little bit of, you know, bird food and uh, some seeds or something. And, and they just kind of hold your hand and the birds just start flying in your hand. And it's sort of pretty cool for pictures. So... Uh, what I did is I lay down on the floor. Um, I lay down on the floor and I just put like food all over my body, and the birds just sort of came and didn't attack me. They just sort of ate. Um, I wanted a, an interesting picture, and yeah, it was pretty fun. So uh, another tour tip for you guys, um, uh, if you do ever go, is uh, you know do that bird feeding experience. It's pretty fun. If you're a little adventurous, do the one where you put it all over your body and you lay down. It's, it's kind of scary, but it's fun. So I'll probably add a question on the test, uh, an extra credit, you know. Uh, what do you, should you do when, you know, as a tourist? And probably it'd be, you know, get food, um, feed the birds or something like that. Also, when I was there, there's a, <laughs> I'm not being paid by Hard Rock, but there's a Hard Rock restaurant somewhere here. I don't know, somewhere further on. But there's a Hard Rock restaurant. Another thing about me, fun fact, I love Hard Rock restaurants. I don't even know why. I don't I don't know. I mean, the food is pretty good, but I don't even know if it's because food is just, I I, I don't know. Uh, but I do go to, I try to go to every place that I go to collect something from Hard Rock. So I remember going to Hard Rock when I was there. So maybe I'll have another question, another extra credit. Uh, what restaurant did I go to when I was there? And it would be Hard Rock. Uh, okay, so now this is St. Mark Venice. So we, we this is so the pigeons are, uh, yeah. So pigeons are somewhere here in front of the entrance, and and so this is um, another um, uh, Byzantine uh, basilica based on the Justinian Holy Apostle, 
And so this was a very important church as well. I think it's the second important church. And, and this church, um, I think, is where Justinian is actually being buried, is, is where he's buried. And, and we talked about the five domes. Remember, we talked about this sort of five domes, you count one, two, three, four, five. And that's sort of the, the guide that is doing this grid, following by these five domes. The narthex on each side of the next. So you see the sort of the narthex being there. And the baptistry is also on, on, the, on the south side. Something that I sort of forget that's very, very important is also the idea of east to west. So uh, usually uh, the transept, you know, so usually one of the, the, the they try to always um, put, point everything towards the east to the west side. And, and I think uh, we'll see that later on. But if not, try to remember that. It's also so important. So here, this is a picture, I think, actually from your book. And just to see, you know, all the pigeons, it's crazy. Uh, this is, you see an aerial view of, of, the, the, of the Santa, some, you know, the Venice. And so uh, you see this, five domes, you know, just sort of going. And it's, and it's it's really, really, really amazing. When I went, it was flooded. It was not so fun. I went back a couple of years back, and it wasn't flooded. So that was, that was pretty good. So you start seeing that the domes really represented there. Something that I want to talk about is that uh, really, really quickly is we talked about the idea of having um, having some sort of relic or having the church being for someone. So Venice didn't have anyone. Venice didn't have a church. It wasn't really, it was sort of like a city that they ignored. No one really cared too much about it. But Venice started getting strong because, you know, boats and things. And so they started um, uh, raiding and going to places and stealing things. So that's sort of something that they be, became known for. So two things that they became known for stealing was St. Was Mark's. Uh, which was the name of the, the church. Um, so the, the way that the story goes is that St. Mark, they basically went and they stole the body of St. Mark. And here's a picture of them stealing the body. And it's, this is an amazing picture. Again, I love art history. You see this, you see this sort of symmetry. You see this sort of, um, you see this sort of, uh, Axes, and it's, I won't talk too much about it, but it's really, really amazing. Uh, but uh, they, you, they, you see how they, um, they stole the body. The story goes that they had to go through customs, which apparently was a thing throughout during that time, and they had to go through customs. But in order to go to customs, they they hid the body in in full of pig skin, and so uh, you know when they open, they say, "Let me see what you have," and it's like, "Oh, it's just pig, whatever." And it's like, okay, close it, whatever, just go. So the, the story goes that they hid the body and eventually they were able to, to bring him to Venice. Another thing that they stole is these horses that are here in the very, very, very front, very top. And uh, just um, also that they stole, they stole from uh, uh, Constant, uh, Constantinople in one of the raids, which wasn't a good thing. Uh, you know, it, was, it wasn't one of the good things, but... It, it, um, it's part of the story, so it's good to know if you ever visit. I, I won't talk too much about it. I want you to read a little bit more on your own in the book. And But it's, there's this side of the Ro Russian architecture, that Russian uh, Byzantine. This in itself will be on your quiz. So it's important to study specifically this one. But it's a really short part of the book. So I won't take too much on that, so I won't spend a lot of time. I, I know this lecture is already getting pretty long. But just read a little bit about that and how the Ro Russian really took... Um, uh, they started uh, uh, really following the, the steps of, of the Byzantine. There was a point that they almost, uh, they were calling themselves the, the, the third Rome. So they were really trying to, it says Rome, as Rome was falling, they were like, we're the new Rome. Um, but I don't know if that really stuck. Um, so yeah, let's just, uh, so in conclusion, how do you really recognize the Byzantine church? How do you really know that it's a Byzantine church? So it's, uh, it's a ground plan. Uh, it has to uh, uh, cruciforms or circular, and has the main entrances from the west. So as I mentioned, I didn't really uh, mention it too much, but I did say that there was this importance of east to west. And so the main entrance is usually west, and it kind of going west. So uh, the altar uh, at the eastern end of the church. So 
So the altar is usually at the, at the eastern. So you enter from the west, you, and then and then the transit is sort of going um, the other side. And and so it has a, I didn't talk too much about, but there was amazing mosaic work in the interior, and it's one of the most recognizable features. There was something called tessera, which I didn't mention, uh, but it's called tessera. And there's so much information. Uh, that's what's good that you still read the book, even though you hear this lecture, because it says there's a lot of information, and I'm sort of jumping and trying to highlight the most important thing. But the tessera is this idea of, like, I think we saw it. That's why I wanted to talk about that uh, the mosaic that we saw about just saying it's this little piece of, you know, gold sort of drawings, and they're just all over. And so mosaic was a very, very recognizable idea of the Byzantine architecture. The exterior are very, very plain. We saw a lot of the, the baptistries. We saw a lot of the things um, that be very, you know, very plain. Again, they try to keep it more humble. They try to keep it a little bit more not so, you know, audacious. It's just more about the spiritual uh, idea. Byzantine is more about domes and supported of pendentives. We talked about square, rectangle. And another, you know, um, talked about mosaics, and so one of the mosaics, the colors that they use the most is blue, gold, blue, just talking about royalty, talking about power, gold, talking about enlightenment, or uh, just religious connotations, but everything has to do with gold, with power, with light, wisdom. Um, so again, the, the interiors were very, very open, so very, very few unrestricted views, so they could really see the art happening. Um, so and then you start seeing biblical stories. You see, you know, if you saw the Baptist, you saw all these different stories, uh, but also very imperial. So the how the rulers, the emperor, tells the story. And the mosaics we talked about it again, but it's just here. It's just small cubes of marble, grass, set in cement, placed in different layers, and then a fresco just sort of on top of it, and just all these different cubes creating this artwork inside. And the the impression of light. So you have this mosaic cubes, you know, it's golden. And you have light just shining on it. It really, really was an amazing experience. So that's sort of the, the whole chapter. I want to go really, really quickly. I know it took a long time. Hopefully, it was interesting for you all. Uh, but I, I do want to share the last part, which is the book. And the book I have a quiz, not a quiz, but I have some review. Um, that we can review some of the, the, the uh, some questions for the, for the test, uh, for the upcoming quiz that we'll be having. So uh, here I have quiz two, and let me see if I can just play it. Okay, so who legalized the, the Christian, remember the Christian uh, religion? Hopefully you know that. I, and some of them I give you the answer and some of them I don't. The reason why is I'm sort of telling you what questions will be on the, on the test, on the next quiz, but uh, some of them I'll give you the answers. Some of them I want you to sort of look, in, look at them yourselves. Uh, and, and the ones I'm not giving you the answers are the ones that are pretty much um, you, um, they're pretty, if you watch the lecture and things, you'll know. The St. Mark's Basilica. Something that you need to know is where was it located, and hopefully my story of gins and all that, and Hard Rock uh, maybe helps you remember a bit more. So where was St. Mark's Basilica? I remember the body that was stolen. Uh, so this is St. Mark's Basilica. Uh, you also need to know uh, St. Marco in Venice. So you also need to know where was it located, but also how does it look like? This might be the picture, or this might not be the picture. We just sort of know how it looks. That's sort of important. So what are they? What are the pendentives? You know, this image will not be in the quiz. I don't think so. Um, but it's just I just wanted you to know what it was. And so just you know try to remember and understand yourself. What was the pendentive? You know, rather than an image, but you know, in words, what do you think it was? I'll give you the answer to this one because, like I said, we went over it very, very quickly. But so the same. Uh, Bath of the Blessed in Russia. We didn't go too much about it. So uh, the quiz won't cover too much about Russia, to be honest, because it's a very short part of the chapter. But just to sort of know, you know, what is this one? 
who was Justinian? And during his reign, what did he do? So that's sort of what's going to be in the quiz. What did he do during the, the, his, his reign? Um, let's see, it's freezing. Uh, what is this church? And it's the reason um, you do need to know what is the name of this church. So there will be an image where, you know, most likely it will say name this church. Not sure if it will be this picture. Hopefully you know what church this is. Uh, but there'll be another image where we'll show you a picture similar to this and you need to you know talk about what era or what time uh is it because you know again it's we're talking about early christian byzantine and the quiz will also talk about islamic architecture so uh just remember this one has to do with byzantine how do we know the domes baptistries what are they i don't think i give you the answer to this one so yeah what is it what are the baptistries for um we talked about those in this lecture, so you should be good with those. Some of the Ravenna, I think some of y'all kind of uh, did more research on this one, so hopefully this data helps. But how does it look like? Uh, so there's a, I didn't have a picture. There's no picture in the book for this. So this, it, hopefully you look up a picture for yourself, you know, so that would be really, really helpful. Uh, San Marco Basilica in Venice has, it, has its interiors covered with golden mistakes. The answer is true. So we talked about, I'm um, giving you the answer to this one because we didn't really talk about it too much. So it's, you know, it'll help you. So, but inside there is mistakes. Uh, I, what do I need to know this one? Oh, so yeah. So what church is this? It won't be this picture. Yeah, it won't be this picture, um, but I don't, yeah, I don't think it'll be this picture. Yeah, I don't think so. But just remember how old St. Peter's looked. There were several pictures that I showed, and also I think there were some in the book. Uh, this one is uh, false. Again, we didn't talk too much about this. How many Sophia's many paints the biblical scenes in the interior? Again, since it went from different changes um, inside. You know, that hasn't really been there. So Byzantine church's plan is, you know, you need to understand uh, it's a, there's, you know, there's several longitudinal axes, which is also called so the Latin cross. Greek, and it's also the, the round plan, the central plan. So just sort of know uh, what are the different catacombs. Uh, I didn't mention them too much, but it's, uh, I guess I did give the answer here. Oh, no, what is it? So uh, I didn't go over this too much it was during the periods where christians were hiding so christians were hiding so they kind of had to go underground and they had to sort of bury people there and it was this, this sort of tunnel system and it's it's, it's interesting um so just kind of google or, or read the, the part where the what were the catacombs most early christian churches were based on Oh, so I, I do give you the answer to that. So most early Christian churches, you know, um, again, it was it sort of evolved from the Basilica, hence the name. Byzantine architecture is characterized by domes. True or false? True. So uh, that's a very clear, easy way to know. So that's sort of it. That's the, the whole um, lecture. Again, hopefully you enjoyed it. Hopefully you, you had uh, uh, you helped you. And now just keep going on to the next chapter. So thank you so much. Uh, and hopefully you have a good rest of your day. Goodbye.